We are about a minute from getting started. Um, so I just want to take some time to preview, very excited, uh, our featured presentation today um, about Washington State, who has really been leading the way, along with a number of other states as well, um, in getting us to the uh, continuum we all want to see. All right. North Carolina, Colorado, Kentucky, Oregon. Great, well, it is noon on the dot, so let's get started. Thank you all for joining us today. Again, hope you all had a very restorative weekend. Um, I am very honored today to, to have our feature presentation be Representative Tina Orwall talk us through some of the work that's been happening in Washington State. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Uh, and as always, we start with an overview of who is on the calls. We have over 64 national organizations. We have participation from all 50 states and I, I think some territories as well with their offices of behavioral health or mental health. We have 11 states who have their Medicaid agency participating, some localities that have their leadership participating. If you don't see your state Medicaid folks highlighted in red, please invite them to this call. Um, invite your colleagues, other organizations that you think can add to the conversation. You know, this information we wanna make sure it gets out widely. So uh, always happy to share ideas and, and of course welcome other countries to give us their tips and tricks as well. Uh, next slide. And of course, you can find more information by going to talk.crisisnow.com, uh, including uh, how to join the learning community. You see the easy Zoom link there, signing up for the newsletters. Uh, and I do want to make a note here for folks. If you have had your calendar invite disappear, um, we did have, there was an issue with a calendar invite could only be extended for a year. So please make sure you sign up and then you can have your calendar invite extended until July, 2023. Of course, on this site, again, if you scroll through the page, you'll see uh, last week's previous crisis jam, uh, links to other segments and hot seat questions, quotes. Uh, this is pretty much your one-stop shop. Uh, for information related to the crisis jam, talk.crisisnow.com. So next slide, please. Uh, and a special preview, uh, I want to highlight that uh, next week, the jam will be 988 Goes Live uh, with a presentation from Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, who's the Assistant Secretary for SAMHSA, that will be hosted by David Covington, who is the President and CEO of RI International, and Debbie, I think he climbs, rock climbs, uh, <laughs> uh, in his spare time, uh, so we have some active uh, folks. Uh, Spartan races uh, who are part of this group. So that will be a very um, special presentation. Of course, the 988 will be available nationwide beginning July 16th, which is a Saturday. Uh, and we will be moving data corner next week uh, to allow for this special presentation. So make sure that you tune in and again, invite your colleagues to join us. Next slide. Uh, SAMHSA advisory uh, from June 2022 on peer support services and crisis care. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Dr. McKeon or anyone from SAMHSA wants to come on camera and off mute to say a couple of words. Well, this is uh, Richard McKeon. Um, so we are very glad for the release of uh, this resource on peer support services and crisis care. Obviously, peer support is, is crucial, has a crucial role in crisis services in many different ways. So we're very glad that uh, we were able to uh, provide this. And certainly, you know, we'll be happy to respond to any questions after people have a chance to look at it. Perfect, thank you, uh, Richard. Karen has placed uh, information in the chat for how to access that resource. And again, if you're not signed up for the SAMHSA newsletter list, they push out great information, great resources. So make sure that you sign up. Next slide, please. 
All right, and we've got some information from the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Aisha, if you are on the line, uh, feel free to come on camera and off mute to describe uh, a little bit of uh, the work that CSG has been doing in their digital day of action. Aisha may not be with us uh, just yet, uh, but they are having a 90 day digital day of action, September 20th. So make sure that you're also uh, plugged in there if you'd like to participate, uh, it's a great organization. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, working closely between uh, the, the various systems to make sure that folks get the right intervention at the right time. Uh, next slide. Uh, this week's featured quote is from last week's host, uh, Vic Armstrong, when he uh, was the uh, commissioner uh, in, in with the North Carolina uh, Department of Health uh, and Human Services and was the chief health equity officer. And the quote is, going back and attempting to fix design seldom works. We must build equity and attention to the nuances of race, culture, and ethnicity into the front end of 988. Again, very timely as we are approaching launch. Uh, and, and of course, Vic is right. Uh, it is uh, easier to build it in and bake it in uh, instead of going back to try to fix things. So thank you, Vic, for that. Next slide. So with that, it is my honor uh, and pleasure to introduce our featured presenter. She has uh, been such a champion for 988 and crisis continuum issues. Uh, one of the lead sponsors for legislation in Washington uh, that would connect the continuum and, and help with implementation of 988 in the state. And so with that, I will turn it over to Representative Tina Orwell. Thank you, Laura, for that kind introduction. I'm Tina Orwell. I have the honor of representing the 33rd Legislative District in Washington State. If you have flown into SeaTac Airport, you have been in my district and it's stunning. We have beautiful views of the Puget Sound and Mount Rainier. In fact, my house faces Maury Island. And if you see that lighthouse on the screen, that is Point Robinson. And I see the other side of it. And it's really hard to see during the day. I almost need binoculars. But at night, when it has that bright flashing light, it's easy to see. In fact, I close my blinds. And when it's dark and foggy, we hear that foghorn. And as you know, lighthouses were built to safely guide vessels to their destinations. And you know, we're in some dark, difficult times, a lot of uncertainty. And so for me, I see 988 as our lighthouse and that we're building a system that's gonna be safe and healing and to save lives. And so I wanna take a moment and just say thank you to all the federal leaders, all the national advocacy organizations, Utah, everyone who made this possible. And I can tell you at the state level, as we're preparing for 988, the 988 Jam has been our lighthouse and it's helping us with best practices, hearing speakers all across the country, and it is guiding our path. And so I wanna say thank you. And it's such an honor to be here on the 988 Jam. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about an adventure we had in Arizona and a little bit about 1477, the legislation we passed. And then there's gonna be a kind of a 988 um, Beatles theme here, looking at four takeaways. Uh, next slide. So we wanted to learn from Arizona. We've been hearing so much about the incredible work. And so we asked like a big group, who wants to go to Arizona? And everyone wanted to go. We took 30 leaders from our state to Arizona and it was incredible. And we had presentations, we took tours, and we learned so much. And we took local elected officials, state leaders, um, leaders with lived experience. We even took the Seattle Times and they wrote a beautiful story about the Arizona system. And if you see that picture in the middle, <laughs> Paul and David, we were having lunch and there was a stage and it had like curtains and it had these two chairs and probably was for wedding parties. And I asked them if they'd sit in those chairs and they're looking at me like, why are we sitting there? But well, we kind of see you as our royalty or 988 royalty. And maybe you don't realize it, but the ripple effects you have every time you speak and you talk about 988 uh, stays with us. Now we learned a lot in Arizona. Our three takeaways, and we have a lot of work to do in Washington, 
uh, peer first. And we learned that RI and International, 60% of their employees have lived experience. Uh, we're really behind having those pathways, the training and the support. Uh, we have pockets of great work, but we really haven't as a system done enough of the peer first model. Uh, the no wrong door. Um, we have, again, good work in Washington, but we have even some psychiatric units that are saying no and are very selective of who they take. And so that whole wrong door concept is really important to us and how we bring that back to Washington. I also really like that they have coverage for 23 hours. You know, if we build these receiving centers and services, they need to be fully staffed and they need to be able to do the important work. So it was a great experience. Um, and thank you to everyone in Arizona and RI. Uh, next slide. So House Bill uh, 1477, I'm just gonna say a few things about it. You know, I first learned about 988 from Jen Stuber and I think she's in New Zealand. I don't think she's here, um, but we all teamed up. We had this huge team on the House side and then my partner, uh, Senator Dingra kind of carried the water through the Senate. And a couple of things I really remember was, you know, we were Zoom. And at one of the hearings, we had 160 people sign in as support. And we have this testimony from Abraham and he lost his wife, Holly. Beautiful, talented woman. She had a long history of trauma. And when she reached out for help, you know, in one circumstance, she was thrown to the ground and handcuffed and put in an ambulance. You know, she was taken to emergency departments where she stayed for hours and then was released without care. And it's really hard to hear these stories and it takes a lot of courage for them to be shared, but they're so important as we're moving legislation of why we need to do this work. Um, so I'm very thankful. Um, and one of the things Senator Dingra said when it was in the Senate, she opened it, she thanked everyone and she said, I just wanna let everyone know we're moving this bill out of committee. So um, there was a lot of momentum. Uh, Senator Dingra and I met every week with telecom and I wanna to have to say, we did negotiate. Um, they worked in good faith with us. I'm really proud we had the fee. You know, it starts at 24 cents and goes up to 40 cents. And it, it fully implemented, it'll bring in about 40 million a year, which we're using for our system. Um, again, I think you've heard, we have the first 98 tribal line, thanks to our tribal leaders and our state agencies and our call center. Uh, and then we set up planning and so we have um, kind of a steering committee. Then we have what's called the Chris committee, which has all kind of leaders. And then we have subcommittees of different topics. One of the things we've realized recently is that we also need to take the planning to the regional level. And so uh, Senator Dinkra and I really want to involve more of the leaders um, on the elected and leaders like providers. Um, so next slide. And so we have three call lines and they're awesome. Uh, in our state and we have uh, a plan for them to become hubs and you'll see the picture from crisis now of that uh, care traffic control. Um, so we really used our dollars, uh, our initial dollars to double the size of the call centers to increase salaries. Uh, one of the unique things about our system is we have next day appointments. Um, and so that's both on the Medicaid side and private plans. Um, we also uh, are looking at building receiving centers. I think you heard about one in Representative Davis district. We're also working on a youth one, which I'm really excited about. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk about the Fab Four 988 takeaways. And of course the Fab Four is the Beatles and I'm a big Beatles fan. Uh, I'm gonna test your knowledge a little bit on four Beatles songs. Okay, so the first song for the first takeaway and you can put your answer if you want in the chat. This song was written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney in 1964. It was performed as part of a global link up. And it is a song that was written to be understood by people of all nations. So I don't know, are you ready for the first song? Next slide. Oh, imagine, that's a good guess. All you need is love. All you need is love. So and Come Together would have been a great song too, thank you. So it takes a lot of love to do this planning, but you know, if you're not dating or with your 911, I really wanna encourage you to ask them out. So we were in a room, thanks to our consultants and the 988 
we had our three nine eight eight call centers and nine one one. And I don't know if Adam's on the call. He is awesome. He is our nine one one coordinator, and he is everywhere. And I think it was like you know, and it, people are on the separate side of the room. And I think it was like maybe a couple hours in, where one of the nine one one operators said to nine eight eight staff, they said, "You have really tough jobs." And 988's like, well, so do you. And there was so much bonding. You know, these 911 and 980 professionals, they have tough jobs. Um, they're under incredible pressure. You know, you got the one, the 911 system, which is kind of a dis dispatch model, and you have 988, which is doing more of the phone intervention with fewer dispatches. But they really came together. And uh, Adam, our 911 coordinator, he said, you know, we're going to marry 911 and 988. So, uh, and of course, when I told my police chief, he said, well, there be prenups. And I thought, well, 911 is more established and has more money, but we want it to be an equal partnership. We think both are important. And there's a lot going on with 911. And I want to mention uh, Laura Leland from our state. She's a national um, leader around 911. And they let me crash a party last week in New Orleans. Next slide. So 911 is doing this whole transform uh, 911, and it's incredible work, and it's community based, and it's really looking uh, at 911 with an equity and social justice lens. And so, um, when you think about what we have in common, we both have shortages in our work, we're a workforce. Uh, there's training issues right now. 911 operators are classified as administrative staff. And these are incredible professionals. So we've been doing work in our state. I had a bill last year to really start addressing this, but there's so many things and they're a powerful team when you go to your capital together. And so again, I, our team is that middle box, um, which was awesome. And then up in that far corner um, are some rock stars from Tucson, uh, the mayor and the police chief. Um, we have the University of Chicago is leading this effort and the NAACP. And so it was this incredible team, uh, really dedicated moving forward. Uh, okay, so are you ready for your next hint? Song number two. Okay, so here's your hints. This song was made famous by the Beatles, but was originally recorded by Barrett Strong. It was also sang by Jackie a chain and a lot of people say you know she was a jazz singer in the 50s and she was the first trans singer okay so i don't know if people have a guess any guesses twist and shout oh that's a good guess ah uh, the best things in life are free but next slide they got it eric got it money that's what i want and so uh, it's a great song. I actually like the Barrett Strong song the best if you've ever listened to it. And so the money is important, right? We need to um, really focus on stable funding as we build this system. And you know, the telecom fee is used for 911 and it's the funding source recommended uh, at the national level. And these are universal systems, right? And so we wanna make sure uh, we're putting that ongoing um, funding. You know, I think one of the things is some states are using maybe the federal one-time only dollars or one-time only state dollars. And it's hard to hire that workforce without really ongoing funding. And so I'm here to put a plug. It's a big lift. This was a tough year to pass any fee. Uh, I think that's why Senator Dinger and I worked so hard to move it the session before. But you know, bring everyone to the table because this really will inject a lot of new resources into your system and really help keep it stable. Next slide. Oh, not next slide. Oh, oh, I missed it. Sorry. Um, I don't know if everyone saw it. So the next. Um, okay. So the next one is a song that is the title of the Beatles' second movie. It's a bad song for Hurdle. If anyone plays that, where you hear one second of a song because it's in the title. And next slide, help, okay, help by the Beatles. And so one of the things I would say is that 988 is bigger than the behavioral health system. Um, really, when you look at primary care, I think it's like 89% of antidepressants are actually prescribed by primary care. And you know, primary care is behavioral health care. And so one of the things that um, 
I had a friend call me and her son, who's a firefighter, was suicidal. He had a plan and he had the means. And when he reached that, when I reached out to his, his healthcare provider, they said, well, you know, you don't have a primary care doctor. It's going to be four to six, four to six weeks before you can be seen. And that's not acceptable. And so really, you know, a lot of our focus is in Washington has been to really bring the carriers along. Uh, with next day appointments, there was a great bill by uh, Representative Cody, which really adds the, uh, to the insurance plan, the requirement to do crisis service and, and post uh, crisis stabilization. In our office, the insurance commissioner, they've been doing great work. And again, uh, I don't know if you can see the elephant uh, in the room there, uh, but it says, um, sometimes even if I stand in the middle of the room, no one acknowledges me. And so again, I think that's kind of the elephant in the room of this issue. Okay, so your last song, and I'm gonna give you the hints before I show you the slide. It was written by George Harrison. Y'all love George. It's the most streamed Beatles song with over 700 million plays on Spotify. Oh, Bridget, got it from the beginning. Next slide. Here comes the sun. Yes. And it was written by George. And he, originally he said that he wrote it because he was in too many business meetings. Um, and then later he said it was because of the long dark winters in London, um, which we can relate to here in the Northwest. But here comes the sun reminds me of these rapid response teams and these crisis teams we're creating, right? They're gonna be clinically grounded, um, their teamwork um, with all of our players, with our police and our EMS. And I think, you know, if we really want 988 and 911 to be partners, we're going to have to figure out for that small percentage of calls, how to rapidly discharge or uh, dispatch crisis teams. And, you know, I think like 15, 20 minutes, right? Because we're going to have to be an alternative to the 911 response. And again, uh, we need people with lived experience in these teams. Uh, we need transportation that's not police, that's really triggering and traumatic for a lot of people um, to go anywhere in the back of a police car. So I think this is an exciting time. I am so excited of all the work that's being done around this country. I wanna thank you. I know it's challenging, but I think it's gonna be all right. So. Again, it was an honor to talk to you today. And again, I'm just so proud to be part of your team here and part of a large team in Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Orwell. Um, I'll echo the comments that this is a fantastic way to share information. Uh, we should have every 988 presentation connect to music. Uh, I think we'll get a lot more folks uh, interested, particularly in the public. So at this point, I'm going to um, bring in our round table. And so uh, our first round table participant is Bisha Mukherjee. Uh, and I hope I said that right. Please correct me if I didn't. She's Washington's 988 steering committee in, vol in a volunteer at Crisis uh, Connections. And also bringing in Laura Van Tosh, who's the director of consumer affairs with Was Washington State Hospital in Tacoma. Uh, by Pasha, B. Pasha and Laura, I'll turn it over to you all. Thank you, Laura. It's um, It was fun. Um, Rep. Orwell, your presentation was fun. Music always makes everything much better. Um, I've been on um, at a volunteer crisis connections for now 25 years. It's been actually a privilege to be there. And I was at Arizona also, um, had the chance to go with Rep. Orwell. It was a wonderful trip, lots of learning, packed two days. Um, I just wanted to reflect a lot of what Rep. Orwell said, you know, uh, things that jumped out for me is certainly primary care is part of behavioral health. Housing is also, and I know that uh, our legislators here at the governor's office, they're all working on that a lot uh, to make sure that there is housing for people who need it. Um, I, I just want to say the thing that jumped out for me in Arizona, and I appreciate uh, Rep. Orwell, you talked about is the peer first model. Being a person with lived experience, I volunteer in the crisis line because I have been through really hard times in life and I've got help and I know what a difference help can make. So 
I want to communicate that to the callers who call. And I do want to say we get calls transferred from 911. So the system already sort of warm transfers do exist. I just hope it expands and the two 988 and 911 work really well together. That would be really awesome. I'm looking forward to all the changes that are coming in a good direction and hoping that it supports people of color, people who are immigrants like me, um, you know, people with the LGBTQ plus spectrum. Um, I'm just very hopeful right now and glad to be on this in this place with people from all over the world and also also the whole country participating to figure out how to make this a good system in Washington, but across the country as well. Laura, Vantosh. Hi there, good, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, just a, a little bio check. Um, it's been more than 10 years since I worked at the State Hospital in Tacoma, Washington. So right now um, uh, it's been a year and 10 years in a state because I moved to Oregon and then I came back. So anyhow, right now I'm a, a, a policy advocate uh, working in the community, um, both at the state and local level and doing some, some national and international work as well. Um, and I just wanna tip my hat to Representative Orwall who I've known for many years now to be one of the most inspiring social worker legislators that I've ever met. Um, she has been engaging the lived experience community within the 988 process as demonstrated by Bipasha and a host of at least the last lived experience subcommittee we had, I think there were upwards of 45 or 50 people and the call before that there were 80 some odd people. So we're really rising from the grassroots trying to meet the call for 988. Um, I do want to say that I had quite a bit involvement with the passage of 1477. I ardently support it. Um, I believe in not having forced treatments. And I think that 988 is our gateway to finally having choice through the use of advanced directives and other tools that we can use to support people making decisions for themselves around crisis intervention. Um, and also maintaining life in the community. Um, I've recently been diagnosed with uh, severe obstructive asthma. I have a heart condition now. Um, also a couple of other things going on. I'm off of lithium after 43 years. So I have my kidneys, um, thank goodness. And I'm just letting people know that integrated care can't be more urgently looked at as well in terms of 988 as we try to help people stay in the community. So I hope, I hope I've been able to share some cr crucial ideas with you. Um, I really like David and his style with Recovery International um, and thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you both for participating. Um, I'm not quite done with you yet, and, and Rep Oral have some questions for you as well. Uh, and again, apologies uh, that we have the bio wrong. Uh, we'll make sure that that's updated for next time. Uh, but you both touched on, you know, I, I think that something that's been a theme throughout um, some of these discussions, and that's. Um, you know, uh, ensuring that the service is equitable and making sure we're including folks with lived experience. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how Washington State is approaching that? Well, I think we're trying to get organized. One thing about Arizona and uh, many, many other states, California, Massachusetts, uh, Maryland, and many in between, is that there are statewide organizations that exist that really move the needle in terms of uh, what happens at the state capitol. And I think we're missing that. We're very disconnected here. I don't know why, because I came back here in 2005, then I left and I came back. So I don't exactly know what happened, but I do know that we, since I've been back, which has been since 2015, we are wholly unorganized and I'm very troubled by that. But I, one thing we do have is we have 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of peer specialists, trained, certified, working in our system. I call them staffing our system. We're staffing the system when in fact we could be helping to nudge it a little bit as well through advocacy work. So I think that there's a wake up call here that's starting to happen. Um, and I think that people are starting to, you know, I guess we should put come together with one of the Beatles songs, make that our anthem, <laughs> make that our anthem and have be Pasha waving the flag, disability pride flag, because it's disability month. I mean, you know, we just, we got to pull it together. But for now, that's why I tip my hat in terms of Representative Orwall, because without her, who's obviously nodding her head in agreement, um, without her, I don't know, I would not be on this program. <laughs> um, she would not be here. So she's really supporting our efforts to come together. I think it'll fit like a puzzle piece uh, within a puzzle that's been laid out for too many years, kind of broken up on the table. And we'll have a picture puzzle together, I hope, before no time. So that's my, that's my fervent call. Um, I, uh, what I'm going to say is what was very inspiring for me in Arizona was what Rep. Orwell also mentioned, over 60% of the staff were people with lived experience. And what we noticed is not just staff, you know, in the, so to speak, lower levels, but all the way up. And I'm a big proponent. I strongly believe that people don't come to mental health without some kind of exposure to something, either directly, someone like me with lived experience, but either through someone you love, your family, your friend, your beloveds, whatever it is. And I think it's time to bridge that gap between people who make decisions and people who decisions are made for, like me. And people who make decisions need to claim their place in this so that we can understand that after all, we're all human. We're part of a spectrum of emotional experiences. We all have them, whether it's a complete breakdown that's just temporary, or a chronic thing you deal with. So I'm hoping that we can incorporate that kind of peer support through the entire spectrum of behavioral health care over here. I know the fact that Rep Orwell and Senator Dingra made a conscious effort to put people with lived experience on the Chris subcommittee. So I, I really appreciate that I'm here on the subcommittee because of that. Um, I also know that they are, they passed a bill actually this year that helps people with lived experience get paid for their time on committees. Because I, I'll be honest, I come from a lot of financial privilege, so I'm able to put in time to do this. But if we really want people who are um, dealing with a lot of different things, in this case, we're talking behavioral health, but let's say it's housing crisis. You want people who've been houseless to be on committees and give input but you're not gonna find them if you don't pay them for their time. So that's another thing I would request states across the country to consider is inviting people with lived experience, but also compensating them for their time and giving them you know, a fair platform to be heard and seen. So that's kind of my take on that. Yeah, no, and there's, there's so much truth in everything you say, and we're so important to have you and Laura guiding this process. And I do need to do a shout out also to Representative Lauren Davis, who really is trying to work on this issue at the state level. Um, but you know, I do think that every planning meeting, uh, as we create every system, um, it does need to be led and, and integrated all the providers with people with lived experience. And it's impacted us all. I've been impacted personally, my family, uh, and it is time to have those conversations and share our truth. So uh, again, uh, I'm excited because of our planning. We're going to do this right. And uh, thanks to the Thank leadership you. by Pasha and Laura. Thank you so much, Representative Orwell and Rep Davis and Rep and Senator Dinkra. I mean, it's been a threesome. All yeah. you need is a fourth and then you'll have the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I, I think the comments, uh, you know, giving kudos to, to the three of you and others in Washington is just a testament to the work that you all do. And, and I love that uh, come together it should be the next slide, right? Because you all have done an excellent job in bringing in the local lifeline crisis centers, public safety. 
great champions like you, Rep Warwall and others. So thank you all for um, sharing that information with us today. Uh, moving to our next segment, just want to make sure that folks know that there are uh, t-shirts available as we get ready for launch uh, of, of 988 or nationwide availability of 988. Uh, as, so the, this will be the prize for individuals who are uh, top jammers. And so those are the top 20 individuals that come to the crisis jam week after week, you will receive a t-shirt as well as individuals who participate in the hot seat and other segments. So if you want a, hot, a shirt, and they're fantastic, uh, make sure that you um, are uh, putting yourself up to participate uh, or checking in every week uh, if you don't wanna be in the hot seat. So very excited about these t-shirts. They will soon be uh, available for purchase on talk.crisisnow.com, but not quite there yet. So stay tuned for that. Next slide. And of course, Karen has uh, put a uh, her email in the chat if you do wanna be in the hot seat. Our uh, hot seat guest today is Bill. And before I turn it over to Bill to walk through uh, the importance of coming to the jam week over week is that uh, some of the questions come from the featured presentation. And today's question uh, is from the June 8th Crisis Jam data corner, uh, not the featured presentation, from Dr. Margie Balfour, who um, took a look at crisis facility data by race and ethnicity for uh, Tucson and Pima County in Arizona. And so that prompted her to ask a question. You'll see here, I'm gonna stop talking, let Bill introduce himself and walk uh, through his, uh, his, his way to get to the answer. Bill? Thanks, Laura. Well, hi everyone. My name is Bill White. I'm Senior Manager of Federal Policy at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and honored and slightly nervous to be in the hot seat today. Um, uh, let's see. Is it an option to poll the audience before I give an answer or should I go ahead? Yes, it's an option to poll, poll the audience. That should be up now. You can also bring in uh, anyone else that you want spotlighted to help walk you through this. Um, but Sounds good. What are, what are you thinking here? There's, I thought this was a tough question. I got this wrong. Uh, so what are you thinking here, Bill? I think it could be B or D. I'm thinking about the region specifically. I'm familiar a bit with um, uh, the Tucson area. I'm leaning towards B though, I've got to say, uh, but I'm interested to see where the audience goes. All right, it looks like the audience is going, uh, American Indian or Alaska Native, but B is not far behind. Would you like to use a friend? Hi, you know what? I think I'm gonna lock it in. I think I'm gonna go for B. All right, well, let's see how well you have trusted your gut. And you're right. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, good job, Bill. It, this was split pretty evenly between uh, some folks when we uh, took a look at the question earlier. So really glad that you were able to um, go in there. But I think it's really important that, uh, and where you zeroed in on is the county. So that's really specific to those counties. Uh, and in those counties, Black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native folks were served at higher rates. Uh, and so if Margie, if you're on the line here, I'd welcome you to join us to talk about some of this data that you went through. Sure. Um, yeah, so it was kind of our first pass at looking at this data and we're currently working on a more formal research project, but I'm um, just started by looking at the population we serve and then comparing it to the um, just the local county population, this for both adults and kids. And we saw that compared to the general population, we served more than our, than the percent, like the percentage of, of say like African-American patients that we had is higher than the county percentage and same for, for native. Um, but when we looked at the Hispanic and Latin X, it was a little bit less. And so then the question is, what does that mean? Is that good or bad? And so then we put the jail population um, up against it and uh, black and natives are kind of overrepresented in the jail. So, you know, perhaps the fact that we serve a bit more than the county average um, or the county percentage, maybe that's making a dent in that. We obviously need to do more research to, you know, really answer that question definitively. But then if you look in the jail, 
the um, Hispanic population was way overrepresented compared to the county population. And so maybe we're not making enough of a dent. And so, I mean, obviously these are just sort of like, just sort of ways to just take a first pass at your data, to look at things, to investigate further. Like we also found that um, we had a pretty, like just compared to um, just, uh, we had a, a, a percent of people that we didn't have, we had missing race and ethnicity data. And, you know, perhaps coming in it, in the middle of your crisis and then going, and how do you identify your race or ethnicity is not the best time to ask that. But that yeah. also prompted us to think, well, maybe we need to do a better job of going back and getting that at some point during that 23 hours. So, um, you know, these are just sort of examples of how you can just do a quick and dirty kind of first pass that you just, you know, rough looking at your data and that can lead you down pathways to investigate further. I think more, you know, we all need to be doing this in our crisis care, especially since every decision to use a crisis service and you know, to divert to the community or to less restrictive care rather than go to high restrictive, you know, higher care, those are decision points that there may be biases in and so we need to start looking at those. Well, oh, thanks, Margie. We look forward to that fully flush uh, research, but uh, also very important points for us to, to take back to our kind of governments, counties, researchers, um, and then, of course, would love to have this on another data corner. If we move forward on the next slide, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Stephanie uh, Hepburn to discuss this week's crisis uh, talk article. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I'd like to welcome Steve Michio. He's the CEO of People USA, which is a peer-led mental health crisis care provider. Steve, can you share a little bit about your own experience with the crisis system? Sure, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my experience was like many people uh, entering the hospital emergency room and going through the uh, process of um, uh, not being told anything, uh, having a security guard stand over me and, and uh, being locked in a smaller room for many hours until somebody had seen me, deciding I had bipolar disorder going up to the unit and, and being welcomed by a, a small cup of medications um, and, and told where my room was and that was my introduction. And so through my whole stay at the hospital, it was just fear-based and, and hopeless. Um, and so it took me years and, and it took me other peers in the community to help me recover because I knew I wasn't alone after I met other folks that were dealing with bipolar disorder. And um, through that process, I, uh, and I got a job at a, a peer run organization called People and we are now People USA. And I started, um, advocacy could only go so far as an advocacy organization. And I started getting into service delivery because I felt we could do it better based on our lived experience. And I created the uh, crisis respites that you hear about around the country. And also- That's the Rose House. The Rose House, yep. Mm -hmm. and, and then we have the only peer run um, crisis stabilization center uh, that I know of at this point, um, which we love and, and are having fun with. and and. Um, mobile teams um, that are effective. And our whole approach is to use our, our mutuality, lived experience, along with uh, lending the vision of hope to everyone we serve, and also providing them uh, better environments uh, to deal with their crises, but using crisis as the opportunity to help them learn how to avoid crises for themselves in the future. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, all along the way, you know, you were so persistent and you had pushback and then you just recalibrated. Can you talk a little bit uh, about the hospital pushback initially and, and what, what took place in order to get that through? Sure, we wanted to, you know, I, I, I wanted to put um, people with the experience in the emergency rooms to greet people and, and offer them, again, a lend a vision of hope and help them get comfortable with that process. But we had been getting calls from a local hospital uh, from people that are being served, uh, complaints around the hospital being punitive and, and horrible and, you know, just not a good place to go for anybody. And I thought that if I could, you know, uh, work with the hospital, that would be great. We could help them do a better job. And they wanted nothing to do with us as a peer run organization of coming to a hospital. 
And so I decided to picket the hospital out, out in front. And um, that that wasn't even effective. No, no one no news wanted to carry that or anything. But I did pick at the board meetings and the board took, a, a, you know, of the hospital and they took notice. And in the end, they uh, replaced their administrative staff with other administrators. And I can't prove that that was, you know, because of what we did, but mm -hmm. they didn't came back to us and said, um, can you put your peers in our emergency room? And that was the start of putting uh, people with experience in emergency rooms from there. Well, thank you so much for hopping on the call uh, for everybody else. Look at the article because he talks not, not only about that interaction and that pushback, but also uh, putting the respite homes, the pushback he received. And I think for legislators, it's really important to see how these developments took place. So thank you, Steve, for being on the call. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Back to you, Laura. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Stephanie. Importance of advocacy uh, seems to be the theme of, of today's jam. So I uh, really appreciate that and hope everyone takes a look at that article. If we move forward to the next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Richard McKeon uh, to give us a SAMHSA update. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, and, um, you know, the discussions today have been so valuable. I mean, the discussion we just had about the importance of peer services um, in crisis care, and we're glad for the, uh, the SAMHSA release uh, of the document on, on that topic, which was um, highlighted earlier this morning. Obviously, we're all very busy getting closer and closer to July 16th and the universal uh, availability of 988 by phone and by text. Um, all across the country. We did want to let you know uh, that uh, SAMHSA will be setting up um, a 988 office open hours invitation, which will likely be taking place late in the day next Wednesday, which would be after um, um, our assistant secretary, Dr. Miriam Delvin Rittman, um, uh, participates on the crisis jam, which of course we will all be looking forward to. Um, I wanted to also take a moment to wish uh, uh, Laura Van Tosh the best in terms of her health, thank her and her colleagues for their incredible advocacy in the state of Washington. And Representative Orwell, thank you so much for all the work that you have done in the state of Washington. Very interested in learning more about um, the work that you're doing on 988-911 coordination, which is really an area of increased focus for SAMHSA over the last um, several months. And I loved your Beatles, um, a way of, uh, of providing uh, information. I'm a big Beatles fan, just saw Paul McCartney at the, um, at Baltimore and, uh, but let me give a trivia question myself, if I can take just a moment. I recently had a birthday. Okay, now, which lyric describes the birthday that I just had? Uh, Paul McCartney saying, will you still need me? Will you still need me when I'm 64? Or Paul Simon, who said, how terribly strange to be 70. Richard, that's not fair. You don't look a day over 35. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Well, it was actually Paul Simon, but I'm here to report that it is not terribly strange to be 70. At least the first three days have been great. And I'm so looking forward to the launch of 988 and for this major milestone for in transforming behavioral health crisis care in America. Thanks. Thank you, Richard, or Dr. McKeon, uh, happy belated birthday, and thank you so much for the leadership that you've shown um, in this transition and for your years of work in suicide prevention and with the Lifeline, so thank you for all that you do. Um, at this point, I'm going to keep us moving forward and turn it over to Dr. Brian Sims for an update from NASHBED. Thank you, Laura, and to Dr. McKeon also, a happy birthday from NASHBED. Uh, but also to Laura for your wonderful hosting capability. Uh, I also want to extend some thanks to SAMHSA in general for their leadership 
and as well to uh, Representative Orwall for all she has done today and the message that she has brought across to us and the phenomenally high level group of individuals that spoke on the topics we heard today. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch bases with you on since the 988 implementation uh, is at hand, uh, the states have been kind of reminding us that there are populations that we also need to take more of a focus in terms of looking at. And Nashbit has had an extended relationship with a center called E4. And the E4 Center is a Center for Excellence in Behavioral Health Disparities in Aging. And it's a center, and the E4 stands for Engage, Educate, Empower for Equity. And this is a wonderful training organization that targets specifically the older populations. And I think in terms of implementation of 988, we need our strategies and skills as far as outreach and connection with the older populations. But the E4 Center is wonderful about not only providing skill sets for connection, but also uh, uh, skill sets, excuse me, for the workforce so that they're better able to do those connections and educate them as well. Uh, I'll place their um, address in the chat box going forward. But I again, wanna thank you all for the opportunity. And Laura, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Sims, for the kind words, and thank you for all that you and NASHBA do to help support states, particularly in this transition. So much appreciation. I don't know if that, um, what is it? All you need is love. Did we already use that Beatles song yet? Uh, but uh, much love and uh, appreciation to NASHBA and all the organizations today. I'm gonna turn it over to Joanna Rosen from AFSP to give us a federal update. So at this point, uh, we the update is we don't really have an update. Uh, Congress is in recess right now, so we know that they are working on um, in their committees. They are working on budgets, so we're looking forward to that. Um, hopefully, the defense and non-defense uh, budgets will be out soon. Um, but right now, we are keeping an eye on that and hope to have some uh, substantive updates for you in the coming weeks. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much, Joanna. I really appreciate you and Sarah keeping a close eye on that. Um, we go to the next slide, then I will turn it over to my colleague, Jordan Pantalone, to give us an update on what's happening in the states. Thank you very much, Laura. Nice to see you all today. Um, just a few quick updates. Um, so first, we saw California pass their budget last week. Um, that includes around $8 million in 988 startup costs. Um, there is still um, uh, AB 988 pending in the legislature there, uh, so we are keeping an eye on that. Um, on a similar note, Rhode Island also passed their budget. Um, that includes uh, $1.8 million for 988 implementation. Um, their 988 bill has passed the House as of June 16th, um, so we're waiting on some movement in the Senate there. Um, and New Jersey's 988 bill, SB 311, um, has officially been signed by the governor. Um, so kind of to go along with that, um, the governor's budget also passed a few weeks ago, which included $16 million for 988 implementation. Um, so those are the state updates this week. Back to you, Laura. Thank you, Jordan. And I also want to acknowledge that uh, Hannah and Steph from NAMI National are uh, not here this week. They are uh, resting up, but do want to thank them as well for their assistance in helping uh, in putting together this map. So. Uh, if we move forward, uh, again, uh, we have the state cards that are put together with input from state uh, officials. Uh, these are state cards for the four states that have passed uh, 988 legislation that includes a surcharge or fee. So we saw Virginia, Utah, Nevada, and Washington. Uh, if any um, officials from those states want to uh, say a brief word or two, I'll give it just a, a moment for folks to talk about uh, any of their um, anticipated revenue or other items. You can also download, download these state cards at talk.crisisnown slash materials. Um, and again, I hope to have more of these developed as more states uh, utilize this option that is available to them. 
So with that, I'll keep us moving and go to the next slide. Uh, there's also the Crisis Now calculator. This is very helpful for states, advocates, individuals. Um, this is put together uh, with some um, assumptions built in, but you're able to uh, uh, customize those assumptions as well uh, to figure out what in the ballpark your state may need in terms of uh, funding, money, right? I'll need a little money, as that Beatles song said, uh, to uh, have that connected crisis continuum. So this uh, calculator is available at calculator.crisisnow.com. Uh, Paul is not here to uh, give us an update, but we will save that for next week or the week after. Uh, if we go to the next slide. An update on uh, Moving America's Soul on Suicide. Uh, these are episodes that feature a uh, variety of participants and individuals with lived experience or otherwise touched uh, by this issue. Uh, we are in uh, production currently for episode eight, but episodes one through five are currently available on masosfilm.com. Episode eight uh, will be uh, featuring Misha Kessler. So very excited about that. Uh, and Karen has dropped the link in the chat. So uh, again, make sure you check out those episodes. Very moving, very important for us um, as we're approaching implementation and even after. Uh, next slide. All right, so this is the schedule. Uh, looking ahead, uh, you'll note that we do have Dr. De Marion Delf Delfin Rittman uh, coming next week as 98 goes live, and that will be hosted with uh, David Covington, Colorado Crisis Hub, talking through the work they've done, excellent work as well. Uh, they've also passed a fee uh, in coordinating their crisis system. So that will be Dr. Michael Allen and Bev Marquez, who's also uh, from one of the Lifeline Crisis Centers, uh, making emergency help accessible for all from Gabriella Wong, very important, as well as coordinating with EMS and 911 in August 31st with Kate. Uh, Elkins. It's a very important topic. And as uh, Dr. McKeon noted, we really want to make sure that we're information sharing and sharing best practices. Uh, you'll notice there are a couple of dates here that do not have uh, individuals uh, listed. And so if you have ideas uh, for presentations, if you have a, pre a presentation you'd like to do, please feel free to reach out uh, and let uh, let us know. I believe Karen has already dropped her email in the chat previously, uh, but we want to make sure that we are showcasing information that is relevant uh, to you all and the work that you're doing. Uh, and, and again, helping to share information and best practices. So with that, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. McKeon, if you're still on the line, I believe you referenced open uh, office hours. Is there a link uh, or a RSVP line that folks have to do for that? No, but be on the alert. That will be coming shortly. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so with that, uh, we uh, have come to the close of our presentation. I hope this was uh, helpful for you all um, and look forward to meeting with you all next week. Thank you, everyone.